Okay, welcome back. Last half of the last session of the last day. First talk. Hmm? Last talk, you said? No, last, last half of the last session of the last day, first talk. Nandini <laughs> Trivedi, Ohio State. Okay, good afternoon and thanks for sticking till the bitter end, almost the bitter end. Um, I'm really uh, grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about some results that uh, I find exciting and I want to share with you. Um, so I uh, let me first just tell you about my group. Uh, this is some of the earlier work. These people have now left my group. Most of the work I'll show you is uh, with Shia Feng, who was here for this conference. And also in the second part, some uh, work with uh, Zach Addison. Okay, so I have two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll talk about the Kitayev model and discuss some of the phases. Uh, but really what I want to focus on are possible sharp signatures. An experimentalist might go and measure to tell us that these are indeed spin liquids. And it's been, you know, usually when my colleagues ask me, what can I measure about a spin liquid? There are many negatives, like, okay, it should not have long range order, et cetera. But that's like a negative aspect. But is there something positive we could tell, we could tell them to measure and especially something that would have a sharp signature? So that's what this part is motivated by. And then in the second part, I'm still going to think about the Kitayev model, but come toward an underlying Hubbard model, and uh, from which in strong coupling you get a Kitayev model, but then we can ask what, is, what, are some, what are the constraints on the underlying Hubbard model, and that has led us to, dis, to um, actually discover a new design principle for getting flat bands. So we've heard a lot about flat bands, and I want to add one more design principle, which is different from what we have heard, and I hope this will motivate uh, more material design and so on. Okay, so let's start out. This will be a story about fractionalization. So we have an electron with charge and spin, and in a Mott insulator, the spin and charge separate. Um, the next hierarchy of fractionalization is you now have a low energy theory of the spin degrees of freedom, and um, under certain conditions, uh, the spin itself can fractionalize into anions, and that is a spin liquid. Okay, so um, let's start out with what we need. We, we want a Mott insulator, so for example, LA2CO4, classic Mott insulator. At uh, low temperatures, the resistance goes, uh, you know, goes to infinity. And, uh, the low energy degrees of freedom, the spins in this case, indeed uh, order antiferromagnetically. This is data from Gabe Epley long back. Um, and the signature of that is our sharp peaks in uh, inelastic scatter, uh, neutron scattering. Now, correspondingly, ruthenium trichloride um, is also a Mott insulator. And we know from susceptibility measurements that there are local moments, and they interact strongly. The Curie-Weiss temperature is high, so they interact strongly. But if you look at the inelastic neutron scattering, you typically get this kind of what I call a Rothko painting. So, you know, beautiful colors, but really no sharp signatures there. So now these spin liquids, can arise, um, and it's a very general uh, topic, it can arise under different uh, kinds of constraints. And we've heard a lot about geometric constraints, like in the Kagome lattices, uh, in which, I'm kind of broadly separating this, in which the spins interact, they could be just Heisenberg spins, but the constraints are coming from the geometry. On the other hand, you could have, um, a geometry which is, um, you know, nicely, um, you can fit an antiferromagnetic state on it, but the interactions are frustrated. And of course, the two, you can have something with both. But I want to go along the route of the interaction-driven frustration, largely because um, the Kitayev model is exactly solvable, 
and we have a very good anchor point. So um, Kitayev looked at this model where you have a honeycomb lattice and on each bond you have a different, uh, you have qubits on each of these vertices of the honeycomb lattice and on each bond you have a different component of the Pauli matrix interacting. So like on the blue bonds is the sigma x sigma x, green it's the y component and red has the z component. Okay, and what he was able to show is that in this model, there is no long range magnetic order. In fact, it has topological order and uh, long range entanglement. So this is a classic uh, spin liquid. And the question is with this anchor point, it would be great to go after materials that have uh, roughly this kind of a Hamiltonian and even theoretically go along different axes uh, where the model is now no longer exactly solvable. So um, the key elements of the Kitayev model are first of all frustration. So if you look at say this site, it is getting three div different signals from the three neighbors uh, um, telling it which direction to align in. So either al align along X or Y or Z. So that is the origin of the frustration. What is the response of these spins? Basically, they fractionalize into four types of Majoranas. The C Majoranas are these black ones, and then the ones which have these colors are the three flavors that then end up giving you the gauge fields. So the, once the system fractionalizes, new degrees of freedom emerge. And this is a standard principle for many of these frustrated systems that from the frustration you get fractionalization and typically you get uh, you know, these uh, matter and gauge degrees of freedom that, are, that emerge. Now in the specific Kitayev case, uh, it allows a, an exact solution, but in general you get these coupled matter gauge theories. Okay, so I will tell you about our discoveries of two new spin liquid, liquids in this Hamiltonian when we add a magnetic field. And in this case, I'm adding the field perpendicular to the honeycomb layer. Um, and also you can make one of the bonds um, stronger than the other two. So that these are the two um, variations we can do on the Hamiltonian. And that leads us to besides the Kitayev spin liquid here, we find one new spin liquid that is a spin, -on, a spin liquid with a spin-on Fermi surface. I'll tell you more about it. And the other one, which is shown here uh, at large anisotropy, Kz over Kxy, um, and this one we have boldly called the primordial fractionalized phase. Primordial because uh, this is it, it, ultimately, the story that I want to get across is that if you understand, it's like a primordial soup of the universe. All the degrees of freedom are uh, at the same energy scale. So from this, you can kind of see the different phases. You can understand how they emerge from this one central phase. Okay. So the design principle for this kind of an in interaction frustrated uh, spin liquid is to start with um, a transition metal ion in an octahedral cage and these octahedral cages are edge sharing and that that uh, gen, you know if it's uh, corner sharing you have just one exchange pathway typically that generates uh, Heisenberg like couplings but if you have these two pathways they can destructively interfere and that becomes uh, a, a way to get this uh, very peculiar bond dependent interactions. Uh, and that was uh, beautifully described by Jacqueli and Kalulilin that um, these, uh, these two pathways, what you're starting out with is a spin orbit coupled system. So the qubits you have are uh, j equal to half qubits. The eigenstates for that are complex and that is where the, the uh, destructive interference, there's a cancellation of amplitudes 
which uh, ends up giving this bond dependent uh, interaction. Um, and uh, now you can see that, uh, you know, for example, this, this particular plane has a Z uh, axis that is perpendicular to it. So that on that particular plane, essentially the X and Y components of the interaction cancel and you're left only with a Z component. Similarly, there's a plane here with X direction being normal and on that one, Y and Z cancel and you're left with the X component. So it's a very interesting design principle which leads to uh, even though it looked like a very strange interaction um, Hamiltonian, it nevertheless can be achieved through these spin orbit coupled systems. Okay, so let's just review uh, what we know from the exact solution. So Kitaev's exact solution is here. Essentially at this point, the C Majoranas have this graphene-like spectrum. It's a gapless Z2 spin liquid and the uh, fluxes, these emergent fluxes are gapped. So we know that, and at small field, essentially these gapless points become gapped and you get a non-abelian uh, gapped chiral spin liquid. Um, at very large field, we expect the system will get polarized because all the spins will turn toward the magnetic field. So that's another regime we understand. On this axis, when the coupling, um, when there's no field and one of the couplings is made uh, larger than the other two, essentially these gapless points start moving toward each other. And when KZ is equal to two times KXY, uh, they merge at the end point of that Brillouin zone and open a gap. So in this region, we get a Z2 gapped spin liquid. So it's really interesting. You can go from a non-abelian to a abelian Thin liquid. At very large KZ, there is the toric, the, this honeycomb lattice maps into a square lattice and the toric code. And again, going along this axis now, you have a first order transition at some critical field to a phase where the E and M charges of that toric code condense and you get a polarized phase. So it's a, it's, it's a nice model with, with the, kind of interesting phases on it. Now let me very quickly flash some results because these are some older results on what we found along this axis. And I really want to get to some of the other parts quickly. Okay, so one very important characteristic of the um, spin liquids is the topological order. And that is essentially an order parameter for spin liquids, and you can extract it, at least in the gapped phases, by looking at the entanglement entropy, which has a boundary term, and a reduction by gamma, which is exactly this uh, topological entanglement entropy. So we can calculate that, and this is what you find as a function of the field axis. So this x-axis here is basically the, the field perpendicular to the plane. And what you see is this gapped chiral spin liquid, instead of just becoming polarized through a single transition, actually goes through an intermediate phase where it becomes gapless. So very unusual that in a magnetic field, you are going from one spin liquid to another intermediate spin liquid shown here. And this spin liquid is gapless. Uh, also, in the topological entanglement entropy, you see it is a log 2 entropy here, and that's just coming from, you can count the quantum dimension of that non-abelian spin liquid, and you get log 2. And then in the gapless phase, this method of extracting gamma is really not well defined. And then at high fields, it just goes to zero because it becomes polarized and a product state. You can also see evidence for these two transitions. You can see this is the susceptibility as a function of field as uh, these results are obtained by dynamical, uh, by DMRG. And you can see that um, this is uh, actually 160 sites. LX is 16. The other dimension is five times two atoms per unit cell. And you can see these two very sharp peaks indicating the transition. 
the way we know it is gapless, we know that from the spectrum, we can also see that from the spin correlations, you can see there are, in both of these two uh, uh, regions flanking the central region here, the spin correlations are short range and you can see that this is a log-log plot. Um, so this is exponentially uh, decaying, but in the middle, we see evidence for power law decay. So that kind of establishes that we are going from uh, a well-known chiral gap spin liquid to some gapless phase in the middle and then uh, back to a, a polarized phase. Okay, so uh, this just summarizes everything here. Uh, very, you know, it's already just this axis. If we had a material, and we do have some candidate materials, ruthenium trichloride, we have heard a lot of discussion about that. There are iridates and so, and also cobalt, some cobalt-based materials. And uh, these are all honeycomb lattices. So the magnetic field is a very easy, uh, uh, pro, a very easy perturbation to apply to it. And the fact that there is so much richness in that is already quite exciting. I'm not talking much about even high field. Uh, it's not as simple as just saying it's polarized. Even the high field region, uh, we find evidence for pairing of magnons. So this, this Hamiltonian is a really rich one. Okay, but let me kind of move on. On this axis, we um, are expecting to go from this uh, gapless spin liquid to uh, the toric code. And I want to uh, kind of focus a little bit now on the excitations because I really want to see if there's a way to see these, uh, some sharp signature of the spin liquid. Okay, so what we have at uh, when the coupling kz is uh, is um, on the order of the of kxy the low energy sector is matter dominated and the gauge sector is gapped out but as we make kz larger the the flux gap is coming down and matter and gauge degrees of freedom start mixing and then the Majoranas actually become gapped at large KZ and we enter the gauge sector. Okay, so can we use this to somehow see a sharp signature? So this is the, um, the calculation we have done. So um, first of all, uh, from the honeycomb, the way you get, a t you get into the toric code is essentially at large KZ, you can concentrate on the on the degrees of freedom on that bond. And the low energy sector, in this case, I'm considering antiferromagnetic uh, coupling. So the low energy sector is up, down, or down, up. So we can construct a new qubit, a new tau qubit. And in terms of that, you can get an effective uh, toric code Hamiltonian. Okay, now, if I turn on a magnetic field, uh, you will see that it will add a, a correction to this, which will go like h square. Now, the important thing here to notice is that a single spin flip will take the qubit into a high energy sector. But if I do two spin flips, it brings back the process into the low energy sector. So that gives a clue as to what kind of experiment to do on this. And so, um, Essentially, what we uh, will focus on is a, okay, let me start here, is a two spin flip process. So if I take a bond like this particular Z bond and do a two spin flip process, so I flip two spins across the bond, it creates these E and M charges. Okay, these are just the E and M charges of the toric code. Uh, and these E and M charges then um, have a spectral function in the two spin flip process, S of K and omega. And if you had a Heisenberg model, you would have a broad excitation, which as a function of field would, would disperse in this, in this way too, and it would get stiffer as you go to higher fields. The Kitayev model, on the other hand, has a very distinct signature. So it has, first of all, 
instead of one peak, it has now several peaks. So I just want to clarify, I'm not looking at a single spin flip now. I'm looking at two spin flips. Um, so, um, the, so now the Kitaev has a bunch of peaks. So that's telling us that it's fractionalized. And if I, and the other point is the energy scale is very low compared to the Heisenberg uh, excitations, which are on the scale of J. This one is very low because it's on the scale of um, uh, this uh, uh, K, to, it's a fourth order process that gave us this low energy scale. Okay, so first it's fractionalized and also it's moving in the opposite direction. Now if I, pick one of these peaks and look at its signature in momentum space, uh, this is what you find. So you find that in momentum space, these modes are linearly dispersing along certain directions. So there was a sharp peak and this peak linearly disperses in the, uh, along these particular directions. So just to visualize it, this is what is happening. We, uh, at large KZ, we basically get a toric code plus the magnetic field adds another term, which uh, is a, like, so the toric code has a star operator which involves uh, tau x and a flux operator which involves tau z and the magnetic field adds a perturbation which goes like tau y. And its role is to essentially move these excitations across in this way. You can, it's, um, this is the attempt to make some kind of an animation, but you can see that because you always move an E and M together, they, uh, uh, they, the, it, the excitation remains sharp. And moreover, it moves in a particular direction. So uh, this motion, which is coming again, uh, this restricted motion, of this composite anion, composite E and M particle, is um, very much like a fracton-like excitation. And this is the proposal we would like to make for uh, observation of something sharp in a spin liquid. Okay, so let me just summarize that here. Uh, basically, if you try to do a one spin flip, um, it's very sharp in a Heisenberg magnet, a two spin flip is extremely broad, but if you have a Kitaev magnet, one spin flip is broad, but two spin flips are sharp and directional and at low energies. Okay, let me now move to the second part. So here uh, our aim was to look at um, uh, an underlying Hubbard model from which at strong coupling, it's like going from a Hubbard model to the Heisenberg and you do the T square over U sort of calculation and that gives you a Heisenberg scale. So that's kind of the corresponding problem we were discussing for the Kitaev model. And the question is if we look at the underlying Hubbard model, what constraints does it put on the hoppings? Okay. So I don't have to tell this audience this, but we are interested in this coming from qu fractional quantum Hall effect as well as twisted bilayer graphene. And uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the parameter which tells us how flat they are, the, ban the bandwidth relative to the distance between the other bands is about a quarter in the twisted bilayer graphene. To this, we can also add some of the Kagome metals that I heard a lot about in this uh, meeting. So now, what is the idea that uh, emerges from these Kitaev systems? So in these Kitaev systems, you have uh, your uh, D electrons, and they are in these T2G orbitals. So basically, you have three kinds of overlaps. You can have overlap, oh, sorry. That was a bit too quick. You can have overlaps between the same orbitals. So something like this, dxy, dxy, like head-on, like sigma or uh, sigma um, overlaps, or pi orbitals, 
uh, which are, say, D, ZX, DZX, but uh, in a pi configuration. Those I'm denoting by T1 and T3. And this third kind, where you have two different orbitals, DZX and DXZ. So you don't need to get all caught up in these different types, but just that you can have overlaps between the same kind of orbital versus different orbitals, and that will play a role. So again, not to go into details here, but just to say this is how we pr proceeded with the calculation. We have some hopping, uh, which is where the spin does not flip, as well as spin orbit coupling, which flips the spin when an electron hops from one side to another. And you have interactions, U, and then at large U, you can effectively derive some magnetic Hamiltonian based on these symmetries. And uh, now you want to basically, uh, the, the terms in this magnetic Hamiltonian are of three kinds. Usual Heisenberg, Kitayev, and the symmetric uh, exchange term gamma. And we want to see how can we make these terms go to zero, the Heisenberg and the gamma term, and only have the Kitayev term left. And what that does is gives a constraint on the hoppings. And the result is quite nice. Basically, what we find is if the hopping between the same orbitals dominate, this is the low energy T2G sector. Um, and th these are the J equal to three half bands. These are the J equal to half bands. And they are both dispersing. They both have a bandwidth on the order of hopping, which is the usual result. But if you enhance the hopping between different orbitals, and you might say, why would that happen? It's the same spin orbit coupling that can control this. So because of that, the J equal to half band you can see is extremely flat. And the width of that is not linear in the hopping, but the because of this interference, the linear term can be uh, essentially driven to zero, and it's a second order process. So it goes like T2 square, which was the hopping of the different orbitals, divided by the, the distance between these bands, the energy gap, which is on the order of the spin orbit coupling. So the flatness ratio, which is the bandwidth divided by the spin orbit coupling, uh, can become really uh, small, uh, can become, this can become really flat. So instead of a quarter for twisted bilayer graphene, you can put some typical numbers, this can become like one over 100. So it's a very uh, interesting design principle. Now at this point, we don't really have any uh, materials, but I'm hoping that, uh, you know, some of you in the audience can, um, can make some proposals. Okay, so um, to, to come to the end then, um, we have uh, by, sorry, by coming to these flat bands, we have now opened another regime that we can explore. The, the spin liquid regime was when the Coulomb repulsion U was the biggest scale. And now we know how to get these uh, flat bands. I didn't really go into uh, uh, the fact that these are not just flat, but they are also topological. So you can break inversion or time reversal symmetry, and you can see they have Berry curvature distributions on these bands. So we have this regime here, and now we can look at even the effect of a tiny U on these flat bands and see what kind of phases get, we can get here. Very, bless you, very much like the explorations of uh, twisted bilayer graphene. So um, the outlook for this going forward, I hope uh, we can, even in the existing not perfect uh, spin liquid candidate materials like ruthenium trichloride, I hope we can uh, ha have some experiments that do two magnon inelastic neutron scattering um, and maybe uh, even Raman, uh, though I, if we do have inelastic neutron scattering, we can also get momentum uh, information rather than only uh, zero momentum for Raman. Um, 
And I also want to add here that um, just because these magnets may have other competing interactions, nevertheless, uh, in ruthenium trichloride, for example, the cation interactions are 10 times G. So that already suggests that do we, you know, doing these um, two magnon uh, or two spin flip experiments could be quite promising. Um, uh, and then searching for materials that would satisfy this um, new idea that we are proposing for generating flat bands, uh, that would be also, uh, I think, quite promising. And theoretically, uh, just the, uh, it's posing a different challenge on how to, uh, this is also true for magic angle, uh, magic uh, twisted bilayer graphene, but here in a somewhat similar, simpler setting because in um, these Moyer patterns, the lattice constants are like 100 nanometers. Here, it's just the usual lattice constant of, of a few nanometers. And um, now trying to put in some kind of projected uh, correlations on these uh, flat bands. And theoretically, that's quite challenging. Um, and some kind of wave function ideas that we are exploring here uh, along the lines of uh, fractional quantum Hall effect look quite promising. Okay, so with that, let me thank you for listening. Very nice talk. Okay, I see no questions at the moment, so maybe I'll start. Can you mention more uh, what, what this primordial phase is and also this EM which move together? I would guess that these are fermions. Or yes, yes, I, I kind of went through that a little quickly. So what they are, are, so in the toric code, you have E uh, excitations, you know, for the star uh, excitations, M for the, um, the plaquette excitations, and E cross M is the fermion excitation. So that is what, uh, sorry, that is what we were seeing here. Uh, the, the, so this is all happening in the gauge sector. As you increase the magnetic field, uh, I have this phase diagram here. So I'm at, at very large KZ, all you have is the gauge sector. At some intermediate KZ, you have the gauge sector at low fields, but as you increase the field, the Majorana fermions come down in energy. And these two are from the same super selection sector, so they can hybridize. And so in the primordial phase, you have both the gate charges and the matter charges uh, hybridizing. And the signature of that is uh, some of the, this, the linear spectrum that you're seeing, linearly dispersing spectrum that you're seeing here, um, uh, uh, you can you can get some um, places in the spectrum where because of the hybridization you have no weight so that is another diagnostic of the inter of the interference between the matter sector and the gauge sector and as a phase where it's just a dashed line so it's all toric code uh, topological order between between the yellow and the white Yes, so the yellow has the matter and the gauge, and the white has only the gauge sector. I see. But in terms of a spin liquid, it is, they are both Z2 spin liquids. So uh, this is the experimental question, okay? So uh, my understanding is uh, with uh, spilled coupling, you know, two different orbital states you know, tend to mix up uh, to create an orbital moment. But now you are saying, uh, you know, with spilled coupling, you know, uh, hopping uh, between two orbital is kind of suppressed and uh, giving rise to flat band. And uh, I have difficulty in understanding why spilled coupling that effectively reduces you know, hopping. It's against right. uh, my intuition. Right. So um, you can have, um, you see, um, the, first of all, without spin orbit coupling, uh, so what you will have are your wave functions are all real. Spin orbit coupling is allowing you to get complex wave functions. So that's how the interference pathways will allow you to 
will allow you to kill the linear term here. Otherwise, this bandwidth of these, when you take these at atomic orbitals and overlap them, the bandwidth will be proportional to the hopping, right? So in order to have the first order piece, the term proportional to T2 be zero, you need some interference phenomena. And that's how now the second order process comes into play. And that is a much smaller energy scale. So, you know, uh, phase method. Yes, phase yeah. method. Okay. okay. Yes. And Andini, so is there some lattice geometry where you would expect this to happen, or do we need to get lucky in terms of computing the T1, T2, T3, and seeing where, uh, where the T2 dominates? Um, I think, no, it's so right now I have given you, uh, you know, we first constructed this on a honeycomb lattice. Right. And very naturally, if spin orbit coupling is large, this should happen on a honeycomb. But it's not restricted to honeycomb. You can expand this to other square nets and other geometries. Yeah. It was, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was wondering if there is, if one of those other geometries would be uh, more, more or less favorable. Um, so in terms, it, it, that would become like more of a, a quantitative Yeah, question. more, yeah, more okay. um, quantitative, yeah. but just qualitatively, I would say uh, all you need for this uh, to control uh, and give you a narrow bandwidth is somehow, uh, so spin orbit coupling definitely is needed. Uh, and thereafter, very, uh, it, this is like, you know, so once you have spin orbit coupling, you will naturally, by symmetry, generate a Heisenberg, you know, which is like T square over U, a lambda square over U, and a T lambda over U, naturally. So then to d kill the other Heisenberg and gamma, uh, having these two pathways interfering is a very natural yeah, way yeah. to get that. Yeah, okay, thanks. May I ask something about the uh, calculation of entanglement entropy? So how is that evaluated? Uh, is it done on the 24 site calculation? Uh, so we did that on actually, so two ways, both using, uh, what I showed you was the uh, exact diagonalization 24 site, using the Levin when uh, or the Preskill construction where you break it into, say, three regions and you have to get rid of the boundary pieces, and then you're left with just the gamma, the, the topological uh, order piece. But you have to get rid of all those boundary pieces because these are small systems. Yeah, that's right. what I actually want to ask about the size effect. Yes, yes, so that's how we do it. Maybe I'll ask another question. Um, can you comment on the sign of K and if it's important for your phase diagram? Yes. Um, the sign of K we worked with was antiferromagnetic. Um, so let me, so the, the discovery of that intermediate uh, spin liquid phase that had the Fermi surfaces, that region, let's see if I can uh, quickly find that. Uh, Okay, uh, that intermediate region uh, is actually uh, very tiny for the ferromagnetic ketile. Uh, so, yeah, you know, th there was this intermediate region here, not shown on this picture, but there was an intermediate region here that shrinks a lot when you have ferromagnetic ketile. So that's why we, we like the antiferro ketile. Now, of course, the question is, what does the material have? And uh, it has been remarkably complicated even to nail down the sign of the ketayev in ruthenium trichloride or chromium iodide and so on. 
Um, now, the other thing that I showed was this, the sharp excitations that were dispersing. That wouldn't matter whether you have ferro or antiferro. It's just the low energy sector will either be up, up, plus down, down, and then you'll make a flip and come back if it's ferro. And if it's antiferro, it'll be up, down, plus down, up. That's the low energy sector. So that wouldn't matter. Do we have other questions? Well, then I would say that we switch to the last of everything talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.